This is lesson four, and we're covering five books of the Bible, Joshua through 2 Samuel. But it will be very general summations of those books. So fear not. The first 12 books of the Bible tell one continuous story. That's review. Uh, It's not until book 13 that it starts to go back and fill in some of the things that were missed in the general story. So, uh, we covered books 1 through 5 so far, and today is 6 through 10. So, where on the chart of our timeline do the books of the Bible fit in? Where does Genesis fit into our timeline chart? Where does Genesis Where does Genesis take place on this chart? Amen. Uh, well, yeah, it, it, it covers Abraham, but does it go back before Abraham? Yeah. Yes, all the way back to creation, through Abraham. And where does the book of Genesis end on the timeline? Probably Moses. Uh, Moses is not in the book of Genesis. Um, it goes up to just when they enter Egypt. The whole family comes into Egypt. These, uh, I should have one of yours to make sure. Yeah, so Egypt, the the timeline is filled in. Genesis covers all that material as far as what takes place. Now, of course, it was not written over that course of time, but that's what it's about. And then Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Where do those books take place? They are all during someone's life. Moses' Moses life, yes. So all those books, the Exodus is leaving, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, they are uh, moving a little bit in chronology, but generally speaking, they're just all right in, during Moses' life, which is between that. So what we're going to start now Today is Joshua. Where do you think Joshua takes place on this timeline? Not during Samuel's life. After Moses. After Moses, yes. So if you want to draw a little arrow, well, this is a poor, poorly drawn arrow, but a little arrow and write Joshua in it. Moses leads them out. Joshua leads them in. Moses leads them out of Egypt. Joshua leads them into the land of Canaan, the the promised land, the land God promised them. So, let's look at our Joshua summary, the book of Joshua. A summary, very general summary of the book, is that he leads the people, Joshua leads the people to take over the land that God had promised them. And when did God promise this land? Back in Abraham. Yes. Yes. About, oh, this is around 1400 Abraham. So over about 500 years previous, roughly, to Abraham. Um, maybe 600. Either way, uh, Joshua was leading them into the land of Canaan to take it over because it's inhabited by the Canaanites. And here are five or four themes of the book of Joshua. Succession. Does anyone know what succession means, that word? Yeah, the handing over from one to the next. Yes, we in our nation have had peaceful succession of presidential leadership. There's never been bloodshed over the passing on of the leadership of our country. Thankfully, many countries, there's much bloodshed when that happens. Succession is a big theme in the Bible, succession of leadership and, uh, and in Joshua. And then the next one is, the next theme in the book of Joshua is obedience. That should be pretty obvious that that's going to be a bi- common biblical theme. Some books, it may not be, but in Joshua, definitely. And then memory why do you suppose memory would be a theme in Joshua? For those who've read it recently, <laughs> if you can think of it. Memory affects future events. That's true. Memory affects future events. And in books that take place over the course of generations, most of the books that we read, if we read novels 
or we read diaries or things like that, they only take place during one person's life. Very seldom does a book take place over the course of generations, right? Um, so if there's a main character of a book, obviously that's, um, there's not going to be a lot of... It's all about Israel. The Bible, yes, yes. The Bible does take place over the course of generations, so memory becomes ex especially important. And Joshua, as the first national leader to take the people into the land, memory is going to be especially important. Why might that be? It helps us lead people. Uh, yes, good. And when he's dead, a new generation, many generations, are not going to remember the parting of the Jordan. Now, this generation doesn't even remember the plagues, but they, um, or if they remember the parting of the Red Sea, they were very young, and they may not remember at all. But the parting of the Jordan was a, another miracle like the parting of the Red Sea. So this generation sees that, but the next generation won't. So what do they do when they, after they come across the Jordan River? They build a monument, and he says, this is what this is for. Someday, when your children are born in this land and they say, hey, what's this big monument, this big pile of stones all about? You can say, this is when God parted the Jordan River for us. I saw it. And then the next generation. So when um, national memory is important and we, it's important to have physical things to help our memory, so when the allies... Um, liberated Germany and they came upon these concentration camps they immediately some of the the officers immediately started to film things because they said we need to remember that this can happen and they said someday people won't believe this which is happening some people don't you know some people deny the Holocaust so it's important that I can tell my kids I talked to Holocaust survivors I spoke with them so that I can tell my children that and then they can tell their children this isn't just something we heard about. This is, you know, this is something your grandfather saw with his own eyes and then they can pass that on. So that's what's happening here. This is not just some story. This happened. This is the spot where it happened. So all throughout Joshua, they build these monuments to, to preserve national memory of what God has done. So that's a huge theme. And then the last one is trust. So I've got uh, a key, key verses here in Joshua. We're going to read them. And as, um, as we're reading these, uh, Karen, if you could read these, as she's reading these verses, be thinking about if you notice any of these themes. And then we'll talk about it. I don't even know what I'm reading. Oh, um, there's some verses in the middle of page one. Mm -hmm. or, or, okay. uh, it says Joshua 1, 5 and following, no one will be able to. They're right there. No one will be able to stand against you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Be strong and courageous because you will lead these people to inherit the land I swore to their ancestors to give them. Be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the laws my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left, that you may be successful wherever you go. Keep this book of the laws always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Okay, did anyone see any themes of succession in that little passage. Uh, okay, good. Right, Moses after Joshua. So as I was with Moses, so now I'll be with you. Mo Moses was the leader, now you're going to be the leader. So succession, there. Very good. Um, anybody notice anything else about succession? It's not very obvious. The land I swore to give your ancestors. Very good, yes. 
Um, I would, yeah, but I would go back to, it's that general area. I would go back to, in verse 7, when he says, um, be careful to obey that, do not turn. So that turning is, this is what you were, don't let this new generation under new leadership, don't let them turn and do something different. So that has a slight theme of, succession to it. Obviously, that has a big theme of obedience. Don't turn away from God's law. Um, But it also has an element of succession in that. Very good. Okay, and then obedience. I already sort of covered that. Be careful to obey. Um, And have I not commanded you? There's some concept of obedience there. What about memory? Keep this book of the law that is on your lips. Mm -hmm. Very good. You see that in verse 8? Always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night so that you can be careful to obey. Obedience isn't just about doing it or not doing it. Um, because when, when you think of obedience in terms of you just gotta, you just got to grit your teeth and do the right thing, the problem with that is that so many situations in life we don't notice when we're disobeying. Um, the typical people who really, really emphasize willpower and obedience become legalistic. And so there's a list, and as long as you're doing these, you're good. You kept them. But... You could call it a guideline. Yeah, there's, there's so many situations in which uh, you just can't Say, like, for example, generosity is something commanded in the Bible. You can't just check off. Yes, I was generous this week. I mean, you could, but there's no exact definition. So many things about righteousness and sin are about attitudes of the heart. And those are things you can't just check off. Okay, yes, I had a gracious spirit today. Um, so if you think about this, the fruit of the Spirit, many of them are not specific, tangible, observable deeds, right? Love, joy, peace, patience. Yeah, so there are, there are too many intangible or hard to discern things about obe- obeying God, like humility and pride. You can't necessarily observe those um, they could be hidden and internal. So what you need is to be always on your lips, meditating on it, thinking on it, so that when the situation arises and you're confronted with something, instead of saying, this person's sinning, that's so wrong, just, you're going to say, yes, we're sinful. My job is to be gracious, let God be forgiving, be understanding, be patient. You, if you're not meditating on those things, when the situation confronts you, you won't even notice that you have a choice to obey or disobey. So that, that concept of memory is very important, to keep it in your mind. That's part of why we emphasize daily Bible reading. Okay, and then trust. Does anyone notice trust in there? It's not... Verse 9. Verse 9? Okay, can you explain how that is related to trust? Where it, where it says, be strong and courageous and don't be discouraged or afraid. I mean, that would be, be total discouragement. You know, that would have to be, especially if you're out like these people were. You know. Yes. Now, you could say to someone, uh, you know, an, a non believer could say to a non believer, hey, don't be discouraged, um, be courageous. But this is has a the word for, F-O-R, after it, which means because, 99% of the time, because God will be with you. That, that with is up above, too. As I was with Moses, so I'm going to be with you. That's why you can be courageous. That's why you won't be discouraged, because I will be with you. God's presence is what enables them to not be discouraged. If they trust God and He's with them, and they don't need to be. Okay, so that was question one. We saw all those themes in there, all four of them. And then they're all throughout the book, too. 
but they're very obvious in that section. And then question two says, what does God mean by, have I not commanded you? Question mark. What does God mean by that? He's asking them a question. Yes. And also when he sends them to the different countries and they have to take over, mm -hmm. that I'll be with your souls and that, and none of them ever got killed. That's right, yes, unless they were disobeying, right. Yeah. That's right. Okay, so when he says, why would he say, haven't I commanded you? Because maybe they were doubting. Because maybe they, like if I, if I give a command to someone, if I'm a police officer and I say, hey, you need to pull your car over here, haven't I commanded you? Well, this means how I told you before. Well, uh, you expect obedience. Yes, that's good. But it would be very strange for someone to say that unless they're, unless they say, hey, pull your car over here, and then they don't, and then you're like, I commanded you. But that's not what God does. He immediately, so he's doing something different with this. This is a very unusual thing. For your benefit. For your, what do you mean? Well, I mean, in your example of pulling the car off, that's for your benefit. Well, you my example was to say we don't normally do that. We don't normally say, haven't I commanded you? So when God says it here, um, he's saying, this is what you're going to do. You're going to lead them in. Be confident. Be courageous. Have I not commanded you? Well, it's like a manager. When he assigns you a task, he also gives you the uh, things you need, the resources to do the task. Right. So if God's commanding them to do it, then obviously they must be able to do it. So God's like, I'm giving you this command so you certainly can do it. I wouldn't command you to jump to the moon. So, um, the, his, the fact that he's commanding them is the basis for their courage. The fact that he's commanding Joshua, be courageous, I'm giving you this command and I'm going to be with you. That's the basis his presence and His command are the basis for that. Now, think about the Great Commission. What did Jesus say to the disciples? It's a very difficult command. Go into all the world and make disciples of all nations. That's a very difficult command. And what's the, what does He give them as the basis? He says, And I will be with you always to the end of the earth, to the end of the age, well, always. It says that here in verse 9, too, at the very last point. Right, yeah. So I don't know if this was in Jesus' mind when he used those words or not. I certainly know that he was constantly using Scripture um, when anything hard happened to him. He was quoting Scripture. Even on the cross, he was quoting Scripture. With the, my God, my God, why have you not forsaken me? was quoting Psalm 22. Um, but regardless, the fact that he has all authority, he says, all authority has been given me, so go make disciples everywhere, and I'll be with you always. His presence and his authority are what give him the basis to be able to do that. Okay, so that's basically all we're doing in, in Joshua. Obviously, if we're covering five books, we can't do much more. But any questions about Joshua or the timeline? If you weren't here when we went through the timeline in detail, it might have been a little confusing, but uh, you can watch the videos on the, going through the timeline. Um, any other questions about Joshua or the timeline or anything we covered on page one? Just one little comment. They're not, they aren't a military power. They're a generation that just came out of the wandering. They have no military force, they don't have any Excuse stories that said what was passed on to them about the crossing, and so there's, there's a lot of uh, common memories that are passed on to this generation, and they don't really have an experience of what happened in Egypt. They saw Egypt, their parents and grandparents saw the power of Egypt and the force and the military force, so here's a people just... It's a band of refugees commanded to take over established nations with walled cities and 
established military forces. Yes, it's a highly, uh, apart from God, it'd be an impossible task. But um, obviously, with Almighty God on their side, it's going to be a very easy task. It should be. As we all know, it doesn't turn out to be because they don't trust God. But um, yes, very good. Let's turn to page two. Okay, the book of Judges. So on our timeline, if you want to actually flip back and fill in where it takes place, you can. But uh, the, the book of Judges takes place over this whole era, four centuries. The book of Judges is about their first 400 years in the land that God promised their ancestors. So they're finally there. They finally get their land, their inheritance. God fulfills that part of His promise. And... Let's see how it goes for them. Here is a little summary at the top of page 2 of the book of Judges. Um, Actually, Deborah Prairie, could you read that summary and I'll fill in the blank for you. The people go in a downward spiral, more and more evil and punishment. God occasionally raises up judges, which were something like... Military and civil leaders. Primarily military, but then they would sort of function as civil leaders afterward. So that's basically what happens. It's just, it's a really bad situation. Um, They were not a unified nation for these four centuries. They were just a tribal confederacy. What do you mean by that? Um... Their leadership was primarily by their tribes, the 12, 13, or 14 tribes, depending on how you count it up. Um, so um, they would band together, though. They were, they were, they would. Con- that's why they used to call it a confederacy. They would band together sometimes if there was a national threat. It would affect all of them. Um, but um, they're not. A nation, a unified nation, for these for these four centuries. Right. Yes. For these, for the first four hundred years, yes, that God's supposed to be their king. Um, yeah, but it's not a good situation. So here's some themes in the book of Judges. Uh, number one is leadership. That's a major theme, um, and that is connected to the theme of succession. Um, um, especially because, well, as soon as their leader that God raises up, the judge dies out, they fall right back into it. Um, and there's all sorts of, as we're going to see, this is a terrible, one of the worst times in all of history in the Bible. And everything is so backwards and upside down, you see things like women taking leadership roles, and when Deborah and Barak go, the man is the cowardly one. And he's like, I, you got to come with me, Deborah. Um, and so you see everything upside down. And then in that, you see a woman, Jael, getting the victory over the enemy leader. And she's using, there's a lot of women using what would have been considered a woman's objects. Like in our culture, like you can picture like a woman with a, a rolling pin hitting the burglar over the head, right? And the man's like cowering behind the, the couch. So the fact that in that little crazy scenario, the woman using the rolling pin, um, you know what I'm talking about, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> there are people uh, that would not know, younger people that would not know what I'm talking about. Um, but... Um, the, that emphasizes the fact that this shouldn't be her doing this. The man should be the courageous one. So you see that kind of thing all the time. Um, Did the women do that though because the men? Yes, the yes. And it's just about the sinfulness of what was going on and everything was wrong and backwards and men were cowardly. So there's the, the, um, the woman who throws the millstone. This isn't like a huge millstone. This is the little hand millstone like this. And that would be something a woman would use to grind out wheat, um, and she throws it down off the tower and cracks the skull of the enemy leader. 
Um, JL uses the tent pegs, which that was what they lived in. That was a household thing. Um, the man would be out farming or hunting, and she would be setting up the tent and tearing down the tent. So the, the tent peg and the hammer w w culturally would be something like a rolling pin, something you would expect a woman to be using. So the leadership is all messed up. Even the religious leadership, there's a story in there where... Um, crazy story. You read through this and you're like, what in the world? He's stealing from his mother. And then he goes and he's like, oh, God's really going to bless me because I've got a, somebody from the tribe of Levi as my priest. And he's got this personal priest in his household and gods. And it's just crazy. Um, the religious and civil and household leadership is all upside down in this book. So that's point number one on leadership. Point number two is a theme is this judge's cycle. Um, there's five steps to the cycle. Uh, Paul, could you read these five steps? The people do evil in the sight of God. God sends a foreign power to oppress them. The people cry out. God sends a judge who delivers them. The land has rest. And then that cycle repeats. Yep. And it just repeats over and over and over again. I don't know. Did I put um, the little arrows there to show? Yes. So this just happens. Now, as far as our application, it's important to just know these stories because um, for a lot of reasons, but as far as personal application, what does step two of the cycle tell us about God and his methods? He'll use other people or things as to... To render judgment. Yeah, sometimes God uses suffering not just to vent his anger. If you think about punishment, sometimes it's just to vent your anger, but as a way to bring people back to him. So. They had righteous leaders, and then they had, for a while, and then they had ungodly leaders for a long time, and then. God gives them a righteous leader again. Um, yes, yes, good. But before we talk about that, I just wanted to, to talk about this suffering thing because that's, that's one of the big questions of life for all people, whether Christians or non-Christians. But um, why suffering? And there's many reasons. The book of Job teaches us that one of the things the book of Job teaches us is that we're probably not going to get it definite answer and we don't God does not owe us an answer as to why suffering but we know from stories like this that one of the things God uses sufferings for is to bring people back to him now if you're thinking something like why would I suffer I go to church and I'm reading my Bible I'm not like I don't have these secret hidden sins like I'm looking at pornography or I'm you know, I'm secretly gambling, I, or whatever. Why would God allow me to suffer? If that's the kind of thoughts that you might think, chances are you're blind to your own sinfulness. Well, isn't suffering also just a human condition until we make it to heaven? I mean, we're in a sinful world. Hmm. There's going to be people that get sick and die. We're going to hurt. I mean, you know, we're going to have sickness. That is all certainly true. This is a broken world and suffering will happen. However, um, to use a poor illustration, if I see someone, you know, with a knife about to make a big cut in someone else that's really going to hurt them, and I have the ability to stop this from happening, but I choose not to, I'm indirectly responsible for it. And so God certainly has the ability to stop any specific thing from happening. And sometimes he does, sometimes he doesn't. We've all heard stories where, you know, like my uncle missed his train on September 11th when he worked in the World Trade Towers. But he missed his train that day. And so God spared his daughter and wife suffering. But others he did not. 
there's other people that died that day that could have been thwarted from getting to work. So why? That's a big question. Oh, yes. Well, God could do everything. He could cure everybody, everything. But if he did, people would get used to it and wouldn't mean anything. <clears throat> they don't really mean anything. Yeah, that's true. They would get used to it. But is that the only reason he doesn't? No, there's many reasons, and the point here is that one of them is because we sin more than we think we do. And we have to be shown. Um, yeah, so when we're suffering, we want to say, you know, is there something I should change, God? And, and, and he, you may not, may not become obvious, but um, it's a, clearly a time to examine your life and think, what can I do better? How can I get closer to God? We had two righteous Christian sisters who died of cancer early. And they, it wasn't anything to do with sin. It's just the way, it, the way it is. Right. There are, yes. Um, yes. And often we don't get answers. And that's what Job teaches us. Job, clearly God chose Job because he was righteous. But even he had things, that relationship with God that improved over the course of that whole ordeal that he went through. Maybe suffering sometimes is not the cause of the person suffering some, but maybe it's to teach somebody else around them. Yeah, so when things like this happen, that God has many, many complex reasons. Mm -hmm. um, we think of it in terms of, you know, I am the clay, he's the potter. And so how can the clay tell us yeah. the potter or what so it, so it, a lot of it is submission to God's will. That's what Job should have done. I don't know why this is happening, but but he doesn't. He really starts questioning and I mean he's on an emotional roller coaster. He lost 10 children um, and and his health and his everything. Um, so it's it's understandable though not necessarily excusable the way he the way he demands answers from God. Um. We really aren't supposed to ever demand or try to demand. I, yes, I know. I mean, because God is beyond comprehension, and his plan is greater for our lives than what we have for our lives. Yes, and, and so when God chooses to allow something tragic to happen, there's countless reasons because it affects you and it affects everyone you know and enables you to minister to people there's and then the, the then the people you know that saw that you know you say I once saw a man who this happened to him and they're telling other people and there's just I mean it's like the butterfly effect there's no way to calculate for a human to calculate all the changes that this is going to cause in the whole world um, and yes but the point here is that sometimes God uses suffering, among other things, to wake us up to our own sinfulness, to cause us to depend on Him more when we were getting self-dependent. See, self -de like getting self-dependent isn't something that you can necessarily quantify. Is that person self-dependent? Is that person? You can't tell. They can't tell. But when God takes an ability away... It's a very quick reminder that we're utterly dependent on, on Him, really. We, we might think of it as circumstances and health and all these little things, but it's really all dependence on Him. Okay. Um, one quick illustration. I had a friend who was very, very strong, able, capable worker, could do almost all the trades, fell off a roof while he was putting on a roof and was in a coma for nine months and woke up a different guy, um, but not because of the brain injury, but because God has shown him, I can take it away like that if I want. His wife thought he was different because he had a brain injury and some kind of amnesia and he changed. He told me privately, and because God showed me I'm not a big man, I'm nothing. So, 
that's, that's just an example of what God does sometimes, and it's hard. But he values our relationship with him more than he values our comfort. Really yes. Did he not at some point, sometime, say, but why? Yes, and God may not give us an answer. That's what Job is all about. They go on for 30 pages. Why, 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 why? Maybe this, maybe this, maybe this, maybe this. And in the end, God says, I'm not going to tell you. God finally shows up. He says, I run the universe. I don't owe you an answer. You, you don't have a... Anytime we say, why would God do that? We're sitting in judgment on God and say, here's God. He chose to do this. Hmm. What would God's reasons be? We're sitting in judgment over God. For good or ill... We don't get to do that. But sometimes he shows us later. Mm -hmm. Yes. We, we Graciously, we sometimes. Us later. Yeah. And when he does that, hold on to that because later, other times when he won't, you'll say, well, I don't know why this time, but I know in the past he's had reasons. Yes. Uh, he doesn't need to do that, but yes, sometimes he does. Okay. Uh, another theme is human wickedness. Theme number three in Judges. Judges is the worst most awful book in the Bible. Um, and so the, the, the theme of human wickedness all throughout shows us why, uh, because of human wickedness, therefore, there's a need for godly leadership. That shows why the theme of leadership is so important. And because of the great human wickedness, it shows us why, as soon as that leader dies, they're right back to their wicked ways. The theme of Human weakness is very, very prevalent. And we'll come back to that in a moment. Key verses. Karen, you did so good at reading the key verses. Can you do it again? So, so that's memory again. And this becomes a cycle of sin, then judgment, and then they forget. Mm -hmm. Judges 17, 6. In those days, Israel had no king. Everyone did what was right in their own eyes. So that verse is repeated. Uh, that exact verse is repeated elsewhere in the book um, a couple other times. In those days, Israel had no king. Everyone did what was right in their own eyes. Sounds like today. <laughs> well, uh, this, was, this was worse. Not the king, but the yeah. The right, what's but. But this is a big theme. Um, like, think about Samson when he fell in love with a Philistine woman. His parents were like, "Can't you marry a Jewish girl?" And he says, "He says uh, no." Different translations translate it differently, but essentially, he's saying, "She's right in my eyes." Um, so that's that theme again emphasized. So when we do what's right in our eyes, it is catastrophically evil. This is another, another way God reveals to us our own, our blindness to our evil. We don't think of it in these terms, but were there not laws and social judgment, we would probably be doing much more wicked things than we are. I mean, we certainly, there are some laws that we are like, you know, whether that's a good law or not, they take that seriously. I am not gonna... If someone's like, hey, can you hold this little baggie of stuff for me? I'm like, no. I don't know what's in that. I don't want to be caught holding that. Right? Because they do not mess around with that. Um, but there's other laws that we're like, well, you know, if I'm going three over the speed limit, they don't care. There's not going to be any judgment. So we're okay with that, partially based on the response we know we'll get. If we lived in a society with no laws at all and no repercussions, we would do much worse things. And there's documentation of that. That people were like, I can't believe I did that. I don't know what came over me. It was a riot situation, and people do things that they never thought they'd be capable of because they knew there's no repercussions right now. I've experienced that, that mob mentality once. And I was sh shocked. I couldn't understand what, I don't remember any thought processes, I just did things. 
not terribly wicked things, but um, but moderately wicked. Uh, okay, so um, uh, luckily we have not only um, laws, but social, you know, if I do this thing, everyone will hate me and it'll be embarrassing and all these things that help keep us in check. Okay, so remember, they are Abraham's descendants. That blank is Abraham. They are in the land of Canaan, the land God promised them. They slaughtered the Canaanites because the Canaanites were so wicked, God wanted them wiped out. But now they are becoming as bad, maybe worse, than the Canaanites had been. By the end of the book, they're indistinguishable from Canaanites. So we've got Abraham's descendants, the land of Canaan. The Canaanites were so wicked, God wanted them wiped out. That's why he waited 400 years to bring them in, partially. But now they're becoming Canaanites, as bad or worse. Okay, so think about um, the key verse, 17.6. In those days they had no king. Everyone did what was right in their own eyes. And then think about the purpose of this book, or at least one of its purposes. Purpose of, of the book of Josh, J Judges, sorry. Of the book of Judges. Just my own personal opinion. It's, it's not a... <laughs> Will we learn from the records which they had past mistakes, or we could think that we are not like them, if that makes any sense, because they had the first five books, supposedly, yeah. Moses, they had mm -hmm. the Deuteronomy, and the, they had all the instructions and the right. sacrifices, and so here they're going in through all the process, they had recorded records, possibly, uh, oral, mm -hmm. written. Sure. Uh, yeah, they knew, they knew um, what the law was, at least initially. But I agree with you that that is one of the purposes of the book. But based on 17.6, can you discern what one of the purposes of the book would be? In those days, there was no king. Everyone did what was right in their own eyes. Well, it was 400 years. It happened again and again. And it happened enough times to show that man ultimately is depraved. And they do what's right in their own eyes. And it's a mess. And that last couple chapters, yeah, it just gets worse. Yeah, it just gets worse and worse and worse. But think about this. In those days, there was no king. That, what does that tell you about when this was written? Before kings. It was written before the kings. It takes place before the kings. But it was written during the kings. I don't say, now in those days, people had cars with keys would start them. Would I ever say that? No, because it's still that way. I would never explain to someone. Now, see, we used to have these things. Back then, they had these things called chairs. We still have chairs, so you don't say that. You just say, you sat down in a chair. But whenever you say, in those days, there was no king, so everyone did what was right in their own eyes. So part of the purpose of writing this book is to say, that's why we have kings now. And when we didn't, it was a disaster. It's, it's establishing the reason that they needed kings. Now, they, yes, they shouldn't have just demanded a king when they did, but they needed it. They needed something. Yeah. The, the tragedy is God was their king. Yes. They rejected that. Yes. And so they were, because they were not obeying God as their king, they needed a human king who would... Well, it would only be good if the human king was godly. They'd have to, the, the fact that they rise and fall in leadership shows they need a king, he needs to be godly, but as soon as a godly king dies, then they go back to their wicked ways. So they need a king, they need him to be godly, and they need him to somehow live forever. Sound like anyone you know or have heard of, hopefully you know. Yeah, the ultimate king that's going to be God, ultimately godly and will live forever. Luckily, he is on his throne now and will be tangibly someday. Okay, so that's Judges, now Ruth. 
Um, Ruth is a very short book. Can anyone sum it up for us succinctly? Lady moves out of uh, Israel because she there's a famine. She's got two sons. They marry local girls. The two sons die. Uh, lady wants to go back to Israel. Tells her daughter-in-law, stay back here. One Ruth says, no, I'm going with you wherever you go. And the weird thing was she was a Moabite. And she became one of the ancestors of Christ then. Yes, yes. And more specifically to the book, one of the ancestors of King David. Um, but then, yes, of course, Christ. That's more important. But um, part of what the book is establishing is this royal line. And this, the book of Ruth happens during the book of Judges. So um, some people see it as an appendix to Judges. Um, but um, it's a Important to know the nation was dangerous, chaotic, religiously blind. They were not supposed to marry foreign women. They do. Um, they should have trusted God. Um, but this, they, were in, they lived in Bethlehem. This shows why J David and eventually Jesus come from Bethlehem because of this story. But there's just some random people from Bethlehem. They should have just trusted God. And the name of their town was House of Bread, Bethlehem. But um, they don't. They go to Moab, they marry Moabite women. But, um, yeah, through all kinds of suffering and problems, Ruth comes to trust in God and becomes the mother of uh, the line of David. So, let's see. Um, I should point out also that Judah and Moab were enemies. The book doesn't talk about that, but they were enemies, like, Cowboys and Indians, I guess. Um, so they actually picked up and moved to enemy territory. Yeah, yeah, um, because there was famine in their land. So um, I guess the Moabites would be, if you had to pick, they'd be the Indians because actually Moabites wore feathers back then. I'm just kidding. They didn't. They didn't wear feathers, but. Um, uh, but yeah, they were enemies and. Uh, some themes here. This is a great book, just literarily. Themes of bitterness, hopelessness, and desperation. Big themes in the book. Other themes in the book are love, rescue, redemption, and reversal. So if you, reversal from bitterness to thankfulness, from hopelessness to hope, etc. Can we call the kinsman redeemer? Yeah, uh-huh, yeah, I... Well, I, I mean, I have redeem, but yeah. You can't get it all. Yeah. You can't get it all, but yeah, the whole, yeah, kinsman redeemer law um, about, you know, if, if a woman dies without a child, then her nearest male relative is supposed to marry her and um, so she can have children. Um, okay, and a key verse. Karen, can you read the key verse from Ruth? So it starts the royal line, especially for people looking back under David's kingship, and perhaps for people from Judah, David's son, um, or grandson's kingship, and they're like, this line of David, um, this is what we were, it was terrible, but then in the midst of all this terribleness, even in the famine and all this, God worked it out so that the line of David started. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, and she's in the genealogy. All the women, the four women in the genealogies of Jesus in the New Testament are all a little... Outside. A little what? A little outside. Yeah, there's, there's something a little bit wrong. I mean, she's a Moabitess. That was, they were an enemy people, and they were born of incest, Lot and his daughters. Um, Moab means from father. This is... A very uncomfortable name. Um, yeah, the prostitute Rahab. All, yeah, but God's works through all of it. And it shows God's redemption. Maybe that's why that happened. Yeah, it does. Um, God taking things, yeah, 
just like he takes us. Tamar, was it? Judah and Tamar? Judah and Tamar. There's always like incest and sinfulness in a lot of ways, and, and God redeems it. God, that's the whole point of the Bible is that humankind sinned and God's this big process of God redeeming us back from that. Okay, any questions about Judges or Ruth? We don't have time. You could do a whole 12-week course on any of these books. Yep. And let me just, real quick, um, Tom alluded to this, but the end of... Uh, Judges is so bad that you can't even you can't even read it in publicly. It's so bad, um, and it's the, the event that happens is so awful that um, it starts a civil war against the tribe that did that event. Um, it's basically, it's gang rape to to death, and then. It's so awful when the man opens the door in the morning because the woman's been outside being raped all night and she's crawling back to the door and her hands are on the threshold and she passes out or dies or something. He opens the door and says, get up, let's go. Steps over her. She doesn't move, she doesn't answer. It's a little bit unclear whether or not she's dead at that point. He loads her up on the donkey and then cuts her into 12 pieces and mails her to all the tribes and says, look how terrible Benjamin is. And then it starts a civil war. Um, so it just, it just is so bad. And even the people back then are like, whoa, nothing like this has ever happened before. This is horrible. And so it starts a civil war. Benjamin is this close to being wiped out as a tribe. But then... Yeah, and they, they don't have any wives. And so they essentially steal wives for him. Um, and the other leaders turn a blind eye to this theft because otherwise the, tri the tribe would die out. So it's, it's pretty bad. It shows, it shows what we are as human beings. We like to think of ourselves, this is just what Larry said, we like to think of ourselves as different from these people. This is us. This is our human condition. <laughs> and they figure out who wasn't there who made that promise, and then they went and wiped them out and took those women. Yeah, it's it's yeah, it's crazy. It's very like suspect. They're like, well, technically they didn't, and then they're like, hey, we made this the the grandfathers or whatever. We're like, hey, we made this promise, and they're like, well, technically you said you wouldn't give them, and you didn't give them because they took them, so it's okay. Just crazy morality. Um, okay, so. We have 20 minutes, which we should be able to cover the book of Samuel. Um, technically, 1st and 2nd Samuel are one book. So let's turn to page 3 and cover Samuel. Um, let's see. Janice, could you read the summary of the book of Samuel for us? The people asked for a king, so he appointed Saul. Oh, hold on. Hold on. Um, no, the summary, right under the very top of page 3. Yep. If it has a three at the bottom, you're on the right page. If it doesn't, you're on the wrong page. Bottom right hand corner should be page numbers, right? Yeah, but that is the Yeah. 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 Okay. Sorry, I just wasn't sure. The should be the. I thought maybe that was it. The consequences. Yeah, so this is a transition book from Judges. That's why that was important. Samuel's the last judge. Um, so this in the timeline, and you can see Samuel's here because he's the last judge. Um, and that's essentially what happened in the book. People ask for a king, he anoints Saul. Saul's not a good king. He starts out good, but he just spirals out of control. 
becomes insane, paranoid. Um, and then David sends, David's this great king, and then, anyway, we'll get to it. Faces the consequences. Okay, some themes. Kingship. The primary purpose of this book is to record the establishment of kingship. This is how it happened. This is how we got kings. And kingship fulfills prophecies. Does anyone remember any prophecies? To Abraham that he would, kings would come from his Yeah. Promise, prophecy to Abraham um, that kings would come from him. What else? Another one. Another patriarch that got promises of that. It's much more obscure. Jacob, um, at the very end of his life, gives these prophecies about his 12 sons, and he says, the scepter will never depart from Judah. Um, so, yes. Um, there's another one, too. Um, oh, there it was right there in black. Ha ha. Okay. Um, Karen, could you read that verse in black? Mm -hmm. So between his feet, meaning from his descendants. Um, so they're talking about Jesus there. We, yeah, well, initially David, and then Solomon, and then all the way down to Jesus. Um, both Mary and Joseph are descended from David through different lines. But you can see Mary's genealogy in Luke and Joseph's in Matthew. They both come from David which David comes from Judah because of the Ruth story. Okay, um, and yeah, the theme of kingship all obviously leads to the ultimate king. Very good. Uh, okay, theme number two is leadership. Does anyone know the main characters in the books of First and Second Samuel? Well, just main characters. Samuel. Um, Samuel is one of the major characters. You could say Eli, but he was doesn't get a lot of time. But yeah, you could say Eli. That's questionable. But um, yeah, Samuel, Saul, and one more. Jonathan, David. David. Yeah. So um, those are the big characters: Samuel, Saul, and David. And then Eli is possible depending on how you want to categorize major. So, all the main characters are leaders. Samuel's the leader of the whole nation. Saul becomes the leader of the whole nation. David becomes the leader of the whole nation. Leadership is a major theme here. Um, then theme number three is courage, which is related to faith, obviously, as we saw in um, Joshua. The basis for your courage is supposed to be that God's with you, which means you need to trust Him. You need to have faith. So, what would be the ultimate example of this in these books? Courage and faith. Yeah, David, very poignantly though, iconically, what would be the story? Goliath. Goliath. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. That's another example of memory. Past events where God helped me, God can help me there. It's Saul chased him around and almost took his life, and David said he would not, he would not interfere with God's man. Yeah. Saul was the, the king. These, these books are so literarily brilliant that they sort of defy simple Aesop fable type answers. Like, what we tend to do is we read an Old Testament story, and if the character is good, we're like, therefore, you should be like him. And if the character is bad, we should be like, therefore, you should be like, not be like them. But that's not really the purpose of those books. Um, David 
Yeah, it's very complex, and I'm not trying to give an answer on this. I'm just trying to show the complexity level of it and how you can read these books over and over again and ponder them and think about them. That's, how, that's the way they were meant to be read. Not, I read it, and I know what it means. Um, so David says, I'm not going to, I'm going to let God kill Saul. I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to kill my king. And so it's very noble and righteous. And he and, knew and, he was supposed to be king. And full of faith and trusting God. Yes. And at the same time, it's very shrewd. And he said, who would lift their hand against the Lord's anointed? Who else is the Lord's anointed? Him. So not only is he doing this righteous thing, he's doing this very shrewd, and sometimes his shrewdness comes to the point of like dubious, but he's establishing you do not do anything against God's anointed because he knows someday he'll be king and he'll have been anointed by God and he wants to establish that. Um, so it just, there's always this little like, huh, wow, that was really politically savvy. So he has both of those sides. Um, there's so many things like this, like choosing his capital. Um, he, he's taking the kingship away from the tribe of Benjamin, which was a big honor because Saul was from Benjamin. And so he chooses a new capital and he takes the city of, from the Jebusites, which was in Benjamin's territory. It's sort of like how we gave a little nod to like Virginia when we chose our capital. Like, we'll let the um, capital be in your state. Is that okay? But then we said, it's actually not part of your state. It's in its own district. That's exactly what David did. He's like, I want to let the capital be in your tribe, Benjamin, but it's not going to be a city you guys ever had. I'm going to take over a new one that we never conquered so it can be established as me, my city. So these are all these political moves and... And he uses Joab in such strange ways. He uses Joab to like do his dirty work and then gets mad at him for it. But he always benefits from everything Joab does. It's very complex. And I'm not trying to say bad things about David. I'm just saying there's all these layers. And so you read them and you ponder them and you think. Um, and it's, that is one of the ways in which the Bible educates us to look at life. It's usually not simple. You see somebody do something, and usually not just one motive. It's usually a lot of complex motives. And so the Bible trains you as to how to look at that. Well, the question I always had about that is, how could God call him? You know, he was after his own heart. He loved God so much. And then he falls so hard and never recovers from that. I mean, just from that point on, from the point of his sin with Bathsheba, he spirals down and down and down. Um, and w let's just skip down. We'll come back, but let's skip down to point C. Uh, so sorry, point six, theme six, letter B. David is the most godly man. Out of nowhere, falls into sin, which destroys his life. It's so he finally becomes king. He's faithful to God all this time. Finally becomes king. Uh, wants to build the temple for God, but God says, no, it's not for you, but I'm going to, you can't build me a house, I'm going to build you a house. God makes these promises to him. He brings the ark, all these triumphal things. He establishes his capital, and it's going so great, and then boom, he falls into sin and murder and corrupts the military, corrupts the leaders, corrupts his ser servants. He's sending these slaves of his household to go bring for adulterous purposes. That's part of it, but it's, it's so out of nowhere that it's a warning to all future people who love God. You can fall into sin so easily. So easily. A temptation comes upon you that you are not expected, not expecting, not prepared for. And before you know it, you've destroyed your life and everyone knows. So it just shows us, all the way back to the beginning, when God says to Cain, sin is crouching at the door, ready to get you. You've got to master it. You can master it. With God's help, you can. Not only... Numbers uh, 4, for, uh, Hannah, was that because she was obedient to God? 
Okay, yeah. Um, number four, parenting is a major theme. All three, and actually including Eli, all four of the leaders in this book were bad parents. Eli was a terrible parent. Samuel was a terrible parent. Saul was a terrible parent. He tries to kill his own son. Um, David was a terrible parent. His son rapes his daughter, and then his son overthrows him as king, and he's on the run from his own son. It's just terrible. The only parent in the book who's a good parent is Hannah, and she doesn't even raise her son. She just gives him over to God. And he's the, the only mother or parent in the book that is given any screen time. Obviously, David had a mother, and he grew up to be righteous, but yeah, the blank is gives her child to God. She gives her child to God and just trusts. And she gives him to a terrible parent. He's going to be raised by Eli. And his sons are sleeping with women at the tabernacle and stealing sacrifice for themselves. And, and Eli's not that righteous either. He doesn't restrain them. He's I mean, he's, the reason he's fat is because he's eating the fat, which he was supposed to burn to God. He's kind of a weak character, too. Yeah. And, and he's just, I mean, he sees this woman fervently in prayer to God, and he thinks she's drunk. <laughs> not it's, not, it's not a very spiritually minded person. Well, you tend to see in other people what you do yourself. Yeah. That's true. It's, That's true. Maybe he's used to seeing young people drunk in the temple and acting crazy and talking, but she's obviously like a heartfelt prayer to God. So she gives the child to be raised by him who is not takes him like three times to realize God's calling this guy. Um, you know, when Samuel's a little boy and God speaks to him. Um, but she trusts God and he grows up to be a great great man of God. God. Yeah, and, and it's, it's hard because it's, it's hard because we want, we tend to think we got to, I know God loves my child and God will protect my child, but I got to make sure God does it, so I'm going to do it too. So do you think that no matter, no matter what David did, though, don't you think that he was still a man after God's own heart? Don't you think he had a special place in God's heart? Yeah, well, I do, yes. I, I think... Yes, I think in some ways he was the quintessential good king who really loved God. Um, and, and you see his remorse in Psalm 51. And, and when he says, against you and you only have I sinned, it's so important that, yes, he sinned against Uriah, he killed him. He sinned against Bathsheba. He sinned against Joab, the military commander. The whole military, you know, corrupted the whole military. He sinned against the people and all kinds of things. But his heart is saying, I sinned against you, God. You gave me so much, and I... So you see that, and you see that God didn't take his spirit away from David the way he did from Saul. Um, when Saul sins against God, he spirals down into je jealousy and paranoia and pride and fear and... He's whiny and indecisive, and Saul makes bad choices. Uh, David has this one episode of sin, and, and it really, I mean, it kind of dominates that. The consequences of that dominate the rest of his life. David, but Saul didn't repent. Um, yeah, he didn't, not, not a true repentance. I, I yes. feel like that's also... For people to see that no matter what you do, have done, when you repent to Jesus, yeah, you can be saved. Uh huh. Yeah. He will forgive you. you. Can't always he will forgive you. You still have consequences. Right, and David truly yeah. is forgiven. Yeah, truly, forgiven, but, but yeah, still bears the consequences of his sin. The child still dies, and all kinds of things. Mm -hmm. um, and David's own words, you know, he'll this man will pay fourfold when he. Thinks his, and Nathan says, you're the man. And then David loses four children. Um, but, um, but God disciplines us. He does. 
um, out of anger, but also out of love. He disciplines us out of love. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because we need it, and I don't think... <clears throat> Right, that's exactly what I was trying to say about, about judges. When God sends terrible things for their discipline, that's when they go back to Him. And if we think that we're different from that, then, then we're not accurately seeing our own sinfulness. Very few Christians would say, well, I'm a greedy person. I'm a greedy person. I'm just greedy. I, I, there's something about me. I'm greedy. And yet, have you known greedy Christians? Yeah. But we don't think we are because when you do an active sin, you know, you stab someone in the chest, you know whether or not you did that. But if you have greed in your heart, it's not as obvious. So, suggestion... If you're brave, ask God to reveal some of your sinfulness to you. Not all of it. Probably kill you. I'm not joking. But ask God to graciously reveal some of it. Um, and in my experience, He does. You have, to ask, you have to keep asking. He won't do it one time. But if you really want to see it, He will. And um, you will be much more grateful for what Jesus did for you. Um, okay, real quick, Karen, read the key verses from Samuel, and we will be done. Okay. 1 Samuel 8, 6, and 7. But, he, but, then, but when they said, Give us a king to lead us, this displeased Samuel. So he prayed to the Lord. And the Lord told him, Listen to all the people, what all the people are saying to you. It is not you they have rejected, but they have rejected me as their king. To obey is better than sacrifice, and to heed is better than the fat of rams. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. But David said to Samuel, Your servant has been keeping his father's sheep. When a lion or a bear came and carried off a sheep from the flock, I went after it, struck it, and rescued the sheep from its mouth. When it turned on me, I seized it by its hair, struck it, and killed it. Your servant has killed both the lion and the bear. This uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them, because he has defied the armies of the living God. The Lord who rescued me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will rescue me from the hand of this Philistine. When Uriah's wife heard that her husband was dead, she mourned for him. After the time of mourning was over, David had her brought to his house, and she became his wife and bore him a son. But the thing David had done displeased the Lord.